What is up you guys? Welcome to another Python tutorial where in this one we will be talking about the very well known matplotlib. But before we get into matplotlib, today's video is brought to you by Datacamp. The most effective way to learn data science today and apply it tomorrow. These days we're spending a lot of time at home so it's the best way to invest your time at very affordable prices. You've got many courses from R to Python and even SQL. The lessons are bite-sized and can fit your schedule. Their mobile version also allows you to learn any course anywhere and at any time. What I personally love about DataCamp is that you could take assessments and check how you did so that you can further enhance yourself. You can get unlimited access for only $25 a month. Check out the link in the description below to explore DataCamp in the first chapter of each course for free. Right, so what is matplotlib? It's a comprehensive library for creating static, animated, and interactive visualizations in Python. It makes plotting data really easy and very fun. So you can plot using almost one line of code. You can also manipulate images, extract RGB components from your image, and you can plot different types of plots such as histograms, 3D plotting, stream plots, bar charts, pie charts, and many more. So in this one, we're going to show you how to use PyPlot along with formatting styles of your plot, plotting multiple plots on the same figure, plotting with keyword strings, and even categorical data, subplotting, controlling line properties, multiple figures and axes, handling text, grids, and many, many more of this good stuff. So without further ado, let's get started. So in case you don't have matplotlib installed on your machine, all you have to do is go ahead and type in pip3 install matplotlib. If you don't have matplotlib on your machine, this might take a while to download. And if you do, you're going to see almost the same messages as I have. Okay, so now going into Jupyter Notebook, we can get ready typing in some matplotlib code. So the first thing you need to know when working with matplotlib is pyplot. Now pyplot is a sub module in matplotlib that contains a bunch of functions that make matplotlib work almost like MATLAB. So each pyplot function makes some change to a figure, right? So in case you want to, you know, plot an X label or label your X axis or Y axis or give a title, a legend and so forth, right? So the first thing you'd want to do is plot your figure, right? So for that, you'd want to import pyplot as follows. So import matplotlib.pyplot and give it an alias. In our case, we'll give it an alias of PLT. So plot for short. And then you'd want to plot, right? So plt.plot. Let's say I want to plot multiples of 10, right? So 10, 20, 30, and 40. Okay. And I'd give a Y label. Um, let's say I'll give a Y label as multiple of 10s. Okay. Last but not least, I'd want to show my plot. You have to insert commas between your numbers, right? Because in MATLAB, it works without commas. So if you insert white spaces, it's the same as commas. So this is our plot, nice and simple. And as you can see, the X axis by default um, starts from zero. So zero indexes the first element, which is 10. 1 indexes the second element, which is 20, and so forth. Now, in case you want your, you know, you want control over your x-axis, you'd have to pass it as you did with your y values. So for that, you'd want to pass maybe 1, 2, 3, 4. There you go. So 1, 4, 10, 2, 4, 20, 3, 4, 30, and 4, 4, 40. Say you want other values. I don't know, maybe 1, 20, 300, and 4,000, right? This is what you'd get. It's not a straight line, right? because your x is go growing exponentially, something like a log, right? So there you go. This is in case you want to control your, your x-axis. Now, let's say you want control. You'd want to, you know, format the style of the plot. So I'm going to copy paste what I had here. So this is, you know, the curve that we had. And let's say I don't want, you know, a straight line that, you know, is blue connecting any two points. So the first point is 110, the second one is 2020, the 
third one is 330. I don't want a blue line. So by default, this is the style that I'm choosing. Blue line. So B means blue and dash means line. Now in case I want, I don't know, maybe red circles, I can do this. So R stands for red and O stands for circles. You have other stuff like X's, um, squares, maybe triangles as power. Oh no, oh wait, there you go. Um, did we do squares? Yes. What else do we have? I don't know. You can also ch uh, choose to change colors. M is magenta. G is green. I think K stands for black. And there's a Y. You have a bunch of colors that you could, you know, play with. Okay, good. And now, you know, now you know how to plot any vector you will and scale its corresponding x axis using pyplot. You know how to give a y label, you know how to format the style of your plot, right? Now let's say you want to plot multiple plots on your figure. How do you do that? Well, let's say you'd want to, you know, plot the following functions um, on the same figure, right? So x, x squared, and x cubed. Um, the first thing you'd want is, you know, a vector of containing x values, right? So for that, we're going to call we're going to use NumPy. So NumPy as NP, we're going to define an X vector that is NP dot arrange. Um, let's say you want X values from zero to five sampled at, I don't know, zero, steps of 0 0.1. So this vector would look like this, zero, 0 0.1, 0 0.2. You can change your resolution by decreasing this guy. So in case 0 0.01, you have more values to get a more accurate figure. But I'll st stick with 0 0.1, no problem. This is my X again. And now let's define our three functions, F, which is simply x, g, which is x square, and h, which is x cube, right? Hit shift enter. And now let's do a plt.plot. And to plot on the same figure, let's start by f versus x. So for that, you pass x first, then f, your x values, then y values. You can also pass, you know, your style. Let's say I want an, a red plot double dash so double dash means i want the, the to plot let me show you why am i talking so this is your f of x and let's say you'd want to plot g and h as well so you continue over here you insert a comma then you imagine that those guys don't exist <laughs> so you'd start again so x g and give a style let's say i want a black um and give it an asterisk which means I want to plot my plot using stars. You can also pass a dash so that you can join your stars as such, right? And last but not least, I want to plot H. So X, H, give it a, I don't know, a magenta color, right? And I don't know, um, squares maybe, yes. And give it a double dash or a dash, why double dash? Okay, and over here, there you go. Um, this is how you plot multiple curves on the same plot, right? You can also pass a legend, right? So right here, I can say plot dot legend. Now you could have achieved the same plot in a different way. So you could have done this using three lines. Um, you could have done this as such. So the first plot, let me copy paste this three times. Okay. You could have done the first plot as such as if there's only one plot the second plot as such. So you plot the G and the last plot, you plot your H running this. And there you go. Why is this useful? It's because you can insert a legend. So over here you can label the first plot. So F of X is X because if a person comes and looks at this, at this figure, he or she wouldn't know what this figure is about. So it's better to discriminate between those, you know, plots. And that's where legends come in. So I'm going to label the second one as G of X, that is X square. And the last one, H of X, that is X cubed. If I run, I won't be able to see anything. And for that, I need to call plot.legend. That means insert my legend somewhere, right? 
Um, you can also pass your legend a certain location. So by default, I think it's upper left. So upper left, just plot it, put it over here. You could have said upper right, that is here. You could have said lower right, which is here, and a lower left, which is here. But we don't care. We don't need those three positions because they're overlapping my plot. So I'll just leave it upper left. Um, you could also use nonlinear functions, right? Not necessarily um, linear, quadratic, and cubic functions. You can use any type of function. So we can define another function. Let's say f1 that is np dot cosine x, and f2 that is np dot sine x, right? And you know you could plot those two functions. Um, say the first one in black and the second one in um, green and there you go um, you can pass it the label as we did over here as we did on top say this is f1 of x that is cosine x and the second one is f2x that is sine x plot the legend to show the legend and you see this annoying message you could you know remove it by plot dot show Okay, looks good. Okay, good. Now you can also plot with keyword strings. Let's say you've got a data object, right? Where I've got X um, defined, um, I don't know, from, so MP arrange, you can, you can, in case you do this, let me, here, yeah, let me show you what I mean. So if I go here, if you pass it only one number, it just counts from zero to that number. Unlike what we did over here. So over here, we pass it three parameters. The first one is start, second is end, and the third one is step size. Whereas over here, if you pass it only one number, it means count till that number is starting from zero with steps of one. So this is actually the equivalent of this, right? not to this number, to this number minus one, right? So, so 50, count of 49. Okay, um, so back here, plotting with keyword strings. Um, let's say I've got a data object as such. So X counts to 49, and I've got an array of indicating colors. So let's color randomly using random integers as such. So this guy is also an array of size 50, but each with different numbers. This will indicate different numbers means, think about it like this, each number is a color. We'll use this for colors. And let's say I've got one more, you know, parameter that is dimensions. Okay, think about each plot, each instance on the plot. It has its own, you know, marker size or dimension. So it's also random. I'm not going to pr prefer one um, instance of my data over the other, so random. Okay, this is my data. Say I've got this data as such, defined as such. Most JSON files, most JSON objects take the following form. So a key and an object, a key and a value, right? And let's say I came and I added one data, you know, key that is y values so let's say for no reason i pick them to be my x so this is y equal x right say i pick this let me multiply here by a hundred and then take an absolute value why am i doing that it's because the size should be positive so i take an absolute value and i scale by 100 so that we can see the different sizes Okay, and now you can actually plot using the scatter. You plot first X and then Y, and your C, which stands for colors, is the colors, and your S, which is marker size, is actually in the dimensions. And last but not least, and the most important part is to pass the data. As you can see, they're very small, and there's an error over here telling you 
invalid value encountered in square root? Well, that's because over here we've got positive negative <laughs> sizes, which is not allowed. So correcting this by taking the absolute value of normally distributed numbers would give you a positive size, but they're too small. So let's scale this thing up, multiply by two, still small, five, also small, 10, still small, 100, not bad, but they're overlapping because of course, because what I'm doing is plotting Y versus X. Well, let's add some noise over here np.random dot some Gaussian noise. Be careful, the size should be the same as x and y. And there you go, they wiggle around a bit. To wiggle more, just multiply by something bigger, right? That's the variance, to increase the variance. Times 4, times 10, times 100, and there you go. So we're actually using keyword strings to plot on a scatter plot. You can also give an X label, X values, and a Y label, Y values. And to get rid of this annoying text, you could run plot.show, right? And there you go. Looks good. Be careful. Each time I plot, I get a different plot. And that makes sense because each time I'm generating different, you know, noise or random numbers over here. Now, let's say you want to plot using categorical variables. Well, matplotlib allows you to pass categorical variables directly to many plotting functions. For example, let's say I've got, I don't know, three categories, say group A, um, group B, and group C. So you've got some values attached to each group. I don't know, maybe you're measuring the number of votes in each group or the stock price or the closing opening price, I don't know. Let's say it's one, 20, 50. Um, well, there's many types of categorical plots that you can do. First of all, you can do a bar plot. So a bar plot is a histogram. Um, you pass the bin labels along with their corresponding values. And there you go. So A takes one, B takes 20 and C takes 50. Do a plot dot show to, you know, get rid of the annoying message. Now you could also have done this using plot dot scatter. You pass the names and the values and there you go. So A takes one, B takes 20 and C takes 50, right? You could also have done this using the plot dot plot. So names, values, there you go. The X axis is labeled as group A as labeled according to the names, right? So what you should keep in mind is that when you're using plot, the X values need not only be integers or real numbers or whatever. They could also be string or characters or describing different categories, right? You could also do some subplotting. What that means is that on the same figure, you can insert multiple figures. So having figure one on the extreme left, figure two in the middle, figure, figure three on the right, you could do that. And let's say I want those three figures. So figure A, figure B, and figure C, and the same plot. So how do we do that? Um, you could open a subplot as such and give it a different ID. Okay, so now let's plot those three figures. I'm going to copy paste what I had. So this is the first one. The second one is over here. So plot.scatter, put it here. And the third one is a plot.plot, .plot. I'll put it here. And there you go. To get rid of this annoying message, just run plot.show. There you go. You can give a title, so plot dot title, categorical plotting. And notice that the title goes for the third plot because the title is still running on subplot three. So over here, I should call this plot three, maybe for subplot three. 
or subplot three. Let me call it subplot three. I could do the same thing for subplot two and subplot one as such. Now let's say I want a common title, a title for all three figures. I could run instead, not title, because I'm still in the third subplot. So I'll, I'll, I'll run subtitle as such. Let's call it categorical plotting, right? And there you go. Um, one more thing, you see that the figure is squeezed up, right? Figures are really tall. So to give a figure size, you can go back to plot dot figure over here and pass it the dimensions that you want using fig size, right? Pass it dimensions width, width and length. And there you go. In case it's really tall, in case the it's really, really tall. You could see the scroll down feature because it doesn't fit in one cell. So let's decrease that back as it was. It's still really tall. Not so good. There you go. Okay. This is short, but nine four super. Okay. This is how you do subplotting using matplotlib. And you can also control line properties. So what I mean by that is that you see this line over here, you could have it um, thicker, thinner. You, you get to choose that. And how do you do that? Well, it's easy. Let me get my figure over here. I don't want a subplot. I want it. No, not this one. I want a plot dot plot. This one, right? Okay, um, say you have this figure and you know, you're, you've got problems seeing the, the line um, because it's too thin. That's my case. So you can control the line width using the line width property. So by default, I think it's one. No, one is too thin. By default, it's two, right? You could say four, 40 is too thick. Um, you can't pass something negative by default. It will take it to the positive sense. Um, and there you go. You could pass fractional numbers. Sure. That's how you control your line property. Now, PyPlot and MATLAB have the concept of the current figure and the current axis. So they both share this concept. Now this is done so that, you know, you can manage different figures and even sub figures or subplots, right? Now, let me show you what I mean. Let's say you've got two axes, T1, um, counting from zero to five with steps of 0.1 and T2 counting from zero to five with steps of 02, 0.02, right? Um, well, Let's say you want to open, you want to have two subplots, okay? One on top of the other. So for that, you need two, one, one, and two, one, two, right? Um, so now let's say you want to plot, you know, let's say you have the following function. F of T is E to the power minus T multiplied by cosine two pi T. Well, you can define a function using basic Python expressions, function that is f of t as such, to return this function. So we're going to use numpy's exponential as such, multiplied by numpy's cosine as such. Simple and easy. Well, the figures are empty, of course, because I didn't do any plotting yet. So, you know, you pass right now, let's say I want to plot F of T1 on the first plot using blue circles as such. And on the second subplot, I want to plot T2, um, maybe a cosine, maybe a sine as such, two and pi t 
and as black t2 this should be d2 t2 and black dashes as such and you can also plot on the same subplot multiple figures so as we did previously i could also do this so I could copy this and you know pass d2 that's another figure let's say in black and there you go okay um you can give different x labels so plot x label um x label one and to get rid of this annoying message i'll just pass plot dot show right right so now let's say you want to manipulate text in your figure um well let's start by plotting a figure um let's say i would want to plot a histogram so plot dot hist i've got some x data that i'd want to plot um this is x let's let's refresh x let's say my x is follows a normal distribution with mean i don't know maybe one and variance or standard deviation the sigma um, is 15 so 15 times mp random rand int rand n say i take a thousand samples as such or let's increase the number of samples as such actually no let's um find the, the bin size as such and let's get rid of all this by plot dot show right okay and there you go so this is a you know a normal distribution and let's say i want some text over here describing the different parameters of this normal distribution so i want to say that my mu is 100 and my sigma is 15. you can easily do that using plot.text so plot.text and you can pass some LaTeX code um, simply by R apostrophe apostrophe, then pass your LaTeX code here. So mu is a hundred. Oh, there's something wrong. Well, let's pass the ah. Okay, so you have to pass the position. The position over here. Let's say as such, it's over here. Um, and let's lift it up. Um, there's something wrong. Um, let's decrease this. Okay, this guy shifts all along the X. So let's put it to 50. Okay, looks good. And now let's increase this guy. So 10, 100. Okay, 1000. No, that's bad. Let's say 500. Okay. Now your LaTeX code should take dollar signs as uh, such. So this is a mu equal to 100 and you could say my sigma is how much was it 15 good so this is how you you know you could label you can insert text anywhere in, in your figure so that it looks more professional it looks more informative um let's say you want to give some grids to your figure so um let's say i have the same figure all you have to do is pass plot.grid as such. So calling plot.grid discretizes your figure as such. And let's say you want to limit your plot. So what, what I mean by limit is that you know you don't want you don't care what's going on outside 140 or beyond 60. So so I have the same figure and I want to cut at 60 and at, I don't know, 140. So for that, you call plot.axis and you pass 60, your limits, 60 and 140. There is, it's screaming at me. Oh, this should take also Y limits. So let's say my Y limits are zero and 700. So zero and 700. And there you go. We cut at 60 and 140, but over here we've got zero till 700. And notice that how this guy moved, of course, because dimensions of the figure changed. So I'm going to shift it back in. 
Um, where was that? Okay, 50, maybe it could be 70, no, 60 maybe, 65. <laughs> okay, there you go. And let's say I limit my Y axis to 600. There you go, looks good. You can also annotate text with arrows, right? So let's say you've got a sine function or a co, let's define a T again. 0 to 5 with steps of 01 and let's define an F that is a cosine okay and before I do some I'm going to define an axis using plot dot subplot and I am going to plot F versus T okay there you go plot dot show to get rid of this annoying message and to annotate, all I need is plot.annotate and you pass it the text that you want to show. It's yelling at me because I'm not done yet. One required positional argument x, y. So you have to pass it the x, y. Tell it where you want your, your text to one over here. And you can also pass x, y text as 3 1.5 so 2 1 is a peak right it's a local maximum this is where I want my arrow to be pointing at. I don't want my text over here and that's why I pass XY text as such so XY text is now at 3 1.5 right um, let me give you know let me change the the axis or let me limit my Y axis between minus two and two so that the figure covers local max as such, right? And, you know, last but not least, I want to, you know, have an arrow pointing at towards this local maximum two, one. So to do that, you need the arrow props and pass it a dictionary a dictionary giving the properties of your arrow. So you want your arrow to be black, maybe. And there you go. You can also shrink your arrow using a certain factor. And there you go. You could also be pointing towards this maximum. You could change it to 1, 1. Or this maximum, you can change it to 0, 1. You can also point towards multiple maxima at the same time. So I'm going to copy paste all this as such. And you could also be pointing towards multiple maxima at the same time. So you can copy paste all this. Over here, change the position of your maxima. So let's say you want to point towards this guy, which is at four. And there you go. You can point towards all, you know, maxima. <laughs> you can do that using a for loop. So 4k in range 0 to 5, annotate. So each time you annotate at k as such. And there you go. This is 5 exclusive. So I'll go to 6. And there you go. You can go to 10 looks really nice to me you can do the same thing for the men's so you could copy paste this down here and call it local men be careful you need to be pointing at minus one this time and the x values are no longer k this is a cosine function, right? So the cosine is at minus one. The cosine two pi t is at minus one at multiples of half, right? So at half, that's the first instance where the cosine is minus one at the local minimum. And the other one is three over two and so on. So this guy should be multiplied by 0.5 and add 1 to it right and over here I don't want it at 1.5 I'll put it at minus 1.5 and there you go 
I think there's a small mistake that we did. Um, let me decrease the, you know, the X axis. We have a mistake and what is it? Oh, this counter is wrong. So it shouldn't be as such. It should be as, how do you do that? So we need to count half, then 1.5, then 2.5 and so on. So all I need is K plus 0.5. And there you go. We're pointing towards the local minimum. So that's really how you annotate on in matplotlib. Now let's say you want to scale your y axis, right? Let's say you've got a function, um, or you've got some data, say np random normal located at 0.5, scale 0.4. So you've got a thousand samples, okay? And you know, you, you're going to pick those Y's that are either less than zero, that are either greater than zero or less than one, right? And you'd sort them. Let's see how my Y's look like right now. So plot dot plot Y. So this is my Y. Okay, so this is on a linear scale. All I'm doing is plotting my Y's, that's it. This is a linear scale. I'm going to open a figure, and on that figure, on the first subplot, I'll plot Y versus X. And what is my X? It just, it's just an index. So it's counting till, it's just indexing. So nothing fancy. Right. So let me give a title over here saying that what I'm doing is I'm plotting on a linear scale. Okay. And let's do a plot dot show and let's try to give a fig size as such. Right. And a plot dot grid. Okay. So this is a linear scale. Let's say, oh, and by the way, the, the, the way you control the scale, is through plot, let's say you're scaling your Y axis, Y scale is by default, by default, it's linear. So just that, you know, okay. Now I'm going to copy paste all this over here. And on another subplot, I want to plot on the so-called logarithmic scale. So I'm going to change the title. <laughs> So on a logarithmic scale. So what I'm doing over here is instead of taking, you know, those values, I take the log of those values. So as you can see here, one is 10 to the power of zero minus one is 0 0.1. So 0 0.1, it's over here. So, you know, you, you, you're plotting on a different scale. So this point over here is now this point. This point over here is still this point. Um, if we zoom in over here, the 0 0.01 is now this point and so on, right? This is the so-called logarithmic scale. You've, similar to the logarithmic scale, you've got the symmetric logarithmic scale or the sim log. The sim log, oh, sorry, this one is a 2, 3. The sim log needs a linear threshold which we set to 0.01, okay? The sim log actually is dedicated for not only positive, but also negative values. So for that, we need to scale our Y. We need to have negative values. So, so let's scale our Y, let's subtract the mean of Y so that we have negative values. And one last scale I'd like to mention is the, okay, let me copy paste all this right here. And it's the logistic scale as such, right? Ooh, this didn't, there's an error, <laughs> not an error, but an, a mistake in, it's not, it's not plotting them. It's not ticking correctly. 
but you get the point so with different scales you can different scales could be achieved with the plot dot y scale now let's say you've got some figures um stored in a certain directory or in on some website and you'd want to read them and show them or read and display so for that you'd want to use mread that is read a figure and then you give it or give it to me as an image right maybe to do some image processing with it or i don't know and then you would want to show your image using M show. So I'm going to use images in matplotlib's C book. So C book has some sample images. So the way you could read sample images from C book is as follows. Get sample data. And over here, you've got a lot of, you know, data. Let's say I'd want the grass hopper.png as an image file and to read the data all I have to do is plt.m read the image file as such so now to display the figure or the image all I need is to call m show but m show is called on the axis of the figure so m show let's say I've got subplots I call axe.m show of my image. And there you go. Now, those sticks are useless. <laughs> you can turn them off as such. And to get rid of this annoying message, you call plt.show, right? Now, why is this useful? You have the image as, for those of you who don't know, any image could be expressed or as a 3D matrix containing RGB values. There you have it. And this is our image. Um, you could manipulate the image. For example, let's say I want to crop this image. I want a circular, you know, image like the icon of my YouTube channel, right? So all you could do it, all you need is to call patches dot circle. So for patches, you need to import matplotlib's patches as patches and you could pass the center of your image um pass it the radius and the transform that you want there's many transforms so for that you pass the axis dot trans data okay um we need to save this patch Okay, and now we need to set it. So clip path using the patch. Oh, here you have to pass M as such. Okay, and there you go. So let's say you give it a bigger radius. There you have it. Of course, when the radius exceeds the, you know, the image dimension, you're not going to see a perfect circle. The radius should stay within the image right so let me decrease it more even more 200 and there you go so you want to play with this this is the center so we want it centered at the face um it was 260 perfect okay so this is how you use m read and m show actually Mread and Mshow have a lot of cool functionalities. For example, you could produce barcodes using, you know, those complicated barcodes. So you could play with barcodes or generate your own barcodes <laughs> using Mshow. So to do this, let me show you what I mean. Let's generate some random data as such and take a threshold of 0.7. Okay. Um, so your data is either true or false. For those of you who don't know, um, barcodes contain, you know, binary data, right? So if it's black, it's true. If it's white, it's false or the other way around. I'm not sure about the, the, the logic, but it's either black or white. And you've got many, you know, 
places to place your black and white bars, right? So for that, we're going to use X to generate our barcode. And the way to do so is, let's first open a figure. Um, so in my first figure, I'm going to add an axis as such. So I want my barcode to be placed over here, okay? And I don't really care about those numbers, right? Um, I'm going to set the axis, I'm going to set the axis to off. So set axis off, right? And now over here, I need to plot my barcode using X. But how do I do that? Well, my barcode data couldn't be passed as is. We need this sort of dictionary, right? So the dictionary is a CMAP pass it CMAP binary as for binary data. And then you go ahead and plot your barcode using the X data, the true or false. So you'd want to use M show for that. X dot, you need to reshape it as well. And you pass bar properties. As you can see, they're too small, we can't even see them. So um, for that, I'm going to use interpolation nearest and I'm going to place a sort of aspect that is auto and there you go so this is a barcode generated using X of course you could have generated other types of barcodes as such or oh sorry about that we're not generating different X's <laughs> I'm just running this cell so I need to insert this here delete this now it's empty because Rand returns a number between 0 and 1. So white is false. So let's set it to 0 0.9. If you want more blacks, you should decrease this. And there you go. An acceptable number is something around 0.5 or 0.7. And there you go. You could also have chosen to lay this barcode um, horizontally. Um, you could have done so using, let's create another axis, um, axis two. Um, let's pass the following numbers, still vertical. This is a good region. Let me set the axis to off, right? And now using the same thing, what we did, but now on axis two, and there you go. Oops, we did a mistake. What is the mistake? It's by the reshaping. So now you need to reshape the other way around okay there you go each time we have a different barcode but the same one is placed vertically and horizontally right and last but not least plot dot show to get rid of the annoying message so this was a barcode demo showing you how to generate your own barcodes using matplotlib's very own m show or image show now you can also work with layer images. For those of you who work with photo editing and or video editing, um, this is a really good functionality and it's good to know where or how to manipulate images using layers. So layer images is when you, you know, place one image on top of the other and you give each one a different alpha blending, right? So let me, let me show you what I mean. So um, let's say I've got X axis, NP arrange from minus three to three with steps of 0 0.5, 0 0.05. Likewise, my Y is the same as my X. Let's define a mesh grid. So mesh grid could be accomplished using NumPy's mesh grid, right? And now let's take the edges, the extents, min x, min max x, min y, and max y. Now let's take a figure, plot the figure, and on that figure, we're going to m show the first figure, that is, um, let's say I've got following info 
So let's say I want a certain chessboard. Um, I'd have to take the modulo 2 of this thing and see how it looks like. There's a problem. Okay, this is not an M show with an O, not a P. And there's another problem. This guy is not out, it's outer. And there you go. This is a checkerboard or a chessboard, whatever you want to call it. Uh, so let's change the color map. So C map. I want it to be a bit grayish. And there you go, black and white. So you call color the gray color map. Um, let's set the interpolation to nearest. Right, so this is my first image, okay? Now my second image, M2, is going to contain another information. It's going to contain a certain function, okay? A certain function. And this function is going to, you know, blow somewhere here. We're going to make it blow somewhere here. You know, we're going to see some Gaussian, you know, um, blur over here. So let's define a function containing some Gaussian information. Um, define f, it's a function of x, y, and now return mp dot exponential minus x squared. So this is a 2D Gaussian function times y squared. Um, M show. Now, as you can see, we just, you know, forgot about the first image and just you know, plot it on top of the this image. So there's no layer layers going on over here. We should be able to blend their alphas, right? So, so for that, we're going to give an alpha for this guy, an alpha of 0.9. That's one, and I'm going to give it a C map of Veridis as such. The interpolation over here is going to be picked as bilinear and the extent is actually extent. And there you have it. Looks really nice. So this is what we mean by alpha blending, right? You just blended two, you know, figures, each with a different alpha. So the alpha up here is, I think it's one, it's one by default. So let's say I set it to point 0.1, it starts fading away. So back to one. And actually this function over here, you could play around with it. So the, if you have another function, of course you're not going to have the same shape. So let's say you have a point 0.1 over here. So you know that the Gaussian curve goes fatter as this goes smaller and go, grows thinner as this goes larger. So this is inversely proportional to its standard deviation, right? Um, other variations of blurs contain some function multiplying your Gaussian blur. Say we've got this. Um, you could move this even more. Okay. You could also contain some Y components. So, so th those are different types of blurs on your image. So this is another functionality of M, M show. Now what more could we do with matplotlib? You can also fill in curves. So let's say you've got a certain closed um, shape that you'd like to fill in, right? Um, and what I, for shapes, I'm going to give you a really nice example. If you go here in, on Google, and type in the Kosh snowflake. So the Kosh snowflake, well, it looks like this, is a fractal curve, and it is one of the most popular fractal curves over there. So for those of you who are into fractal shapes, and fractal shapes are, for those of you who don't know, it's a type of shape that retains its pattern no matter how much you zoom in right so if we take a look at this animation over here in wikipedia we can see that the cosh curve no matter how much i zoom in i get to see more or less the same pattern 
So we're going to plot this using matplotlib and we're going to fill it with any color we wish. So going back onto matplotlib, let's imagine I've got a, you know, a function that gives me my snowflake or my cosh snowflake. It gives me my x, y points of my cosh snowflake. Um, we're going to write this function right now that generates my cosh fractal. And that takes in a certain order. Let's say I'll, I'll pass it an order four. And then I'm going to open a figure, then fill in my snowflake. Then I'll show it. But this will give me an error if I run it because I don't have my function cosh snowflake. So we're going to write it down over here. So let's define a function called cosh snowflake that takes in a certain order, right? So the order is, you know, and I'll show you what order means just after I plot it because different orders give you different shapes. And within this function, I'm going to define a complex cosh snowflake function that is recursive. So if the order is zero, I'm going to return some scale, say square root of three times an exponential times a complex exponential. We're generating this snowflake using complex numbers. And the angles are usually are taken for the cosh snowflake to be multiples of 120, so 120 to 40, rotated by a 90 degree. Because for the cosh snowflake, if we take a look at, go back to Wikipedia, type in cosh snowflake, go back here, we see that this snowflake, you've got 0, 120, 240 and rotated. So this is where this comes from. And else, if this order is greater than zero, we're going to call this cosh snowflake function, the complex version, on order minus one. But before I'm going to define following complex number, And after that, I'm going to roll and shift by minus one. Then I'll take the difference in points to connect the vector. So P2 is my end point, P P1 is my starting point. And then I'll generate new points Initialize them to empty of size p1, length p1 times 4, and they are of type np complex 128 bits. Then I'll fill in p1. Let me copy paste this down here. Then I'll fill in p1 plus dp over 3 and then P1 plus DP times ZR, then following, and then I'll return my new points. And next, I'll generate my points within the cosh snowflake main function using the complex function, okay, on order. And then I'll take my x, y points to be the real and imaginary numbers of points. Since cosh, since cosh snowflake complex works in the complex field, I'll generate my x using the real numbers and y using the com imaginary numbers. And then I'll finally I'll return x, y. So running this and then this, 
this is my Kosh Snowflake of Order 4. Um, it looks really stretched, so let me change the figure size to say 8 by 8. And there you go. Putting an order 1 gives me this. Sweet triangle. Then 2 gives me this. And 3 this and so forth now be careful since this is a recursive function do not and i repeat do not enter a high order so order five okay seems to run order six seems to run order seven starts to get more slow order eight really slow <laughs> okay so this is what fill does. It fills in the image. Notice that if I achieve this using the plot, I won't have it filled in. So fill just fills in my shape. Now for those of you into LaTeX, and if you don't know what LaTeX is, it is a software system for document preparation. Um, you see all those books and um, scientific papers, well, they're most likely written in LaTeX. LaTeX is widely used in academia for communications and publications of scientific documents in many fields, mostly in mathematics, computer science, physics, economics, engineering, philosophy, and many, many more. Um, so if you want to generate a figure with um, LaTeX, Let's say you want your title to be in LaTeX format. Well, you can do this on matplotlib. Let's say you've got the following function. Let's say you're plotting a cosine function, okay, for simplicity. Um, let's say my t-axis goes from 0 to 1 with 100 points. And my x is cosine. 4 pi t plus 2. Then let's say you open a subplot and you plot x versus t as such. Now let's say you want your x axis, y axis, and your title to be in LaTeX. Well, you can do that as such. You set your title, start with an r apostrophe. Close and let's say I want to type in some bit inserted between dollar signs. So there you go. This is the sum notation. Say you want to include limits equal one to infinity. It's not working. I think it's a double. No, it's not double. Let's try to remove the limits. And there you go. And going from 1 to infinity, um, you can include fractions as such, A over B. You can type in, oh, by the way, the font size is really small. You can control your font size as such. Okay. You could also change your color. Let's say color equal B, blue, right? You could put in powers. And exponentials as such. This is IPI. And there you go. You can also set your X label. Again, R, double apostrophe. You can put time in seconds. There you go, LaTeX formatted. You can also give a bold face as such. Bold face is not working well. It's better to go up here and type in matplotlib, the module, the RC params, and set text dot use tech 
to true. Matplotlib is not defined. If we go back up here. Oh, so let me import matplotlib as is. Since we only imported the py plot, we have to import matplotlib as is. And there you go. Looks much better. Actually, this sum looks even better, right? So yeah. And I think right now I could include the command limits because limits looks better. There you go. Because if I didn't have my limits, the limits would be on the edge as such. So it's better to have limits. Okay. So this is how you work with tech in matplotlib. You can also plot polar curves. So for those of you who don't know what polar plots are, um, it's best if we go to wolf ram plot of a function expressed in polar coordinate with radius r as a function of angle theta. When you plot f of x versus x, you're plotting a Cartesian system. So you only draw f as a function of x, right? You vary x linearly and you plot your f. As simple as that. It's a bit different in polar plots as your variable right now would be to vary theta and to plot r. Notice that those functions could not be achieved in a Cartesian system. It's This is not a one-to-one -one mapping, right? It's not because for every, you know, X, you've got two points instead of one in a Cartesian system. So you can achieve those plots using matplotlib's polar function. So for that, we'd need to define theta as a function of R. For example, you could do the other way around. As you saw here, we could express r as a function of theta, but over here, we're going to do the other way around. So theta is equal to two pi r. If you imagine this plot, it would look like you're rotating on a spiral, right? So as r grows large, theta would rotate linearly in r, right? So let's try to plot it on matplotlib. So let's define an r. Our variable is r using NP arrange, let's go from zero to two with steps of O1 and take theta that is simply two pi R. And now let's open a figure. And over here, you'd want to define your subplot, your projection key takes a value of polar, okay? And then you run an, ax, an ax dot, dot plot r versus theta. There you go. But it looks really, there, it's messy over here. So we're going to play a bit with the r max two. We're going to set r ticks as 0 0.5, 1, 1 1.5, and 2, so that it's not messy anymore. And you can also, you know, set your R label position. So instead of having it, you know, over here, you could have it right here. And the way to do so is to change your radial labels away. You could move your radial labels away, let's say minus 22.5 degrees as such. There you go. If you put minus 90, it would go down here. 90, it would go up and so on. You can also give grids. So set grid to true. You can set a title as well. Say, this is my first polar plot. There you go. To get rid of this annoying message, as always, we'd run a plot dot show. 
right? And this is how you get your polar plots done on matplotlib. So really, that's how you play with matplotlib. It's really simple. It's very handy and very versatile. Um, so in this tutorial, we talked about pyplot, how to format the style of the plot, how to plot multiple plots on the same figure, right? Um, how to give a legend, how to plot with keyword strings. We also worked with categorical data, whether it's a histogram or a bar plot, um, a scatter plot or a normal plot. We did subplotting as well. That is, we have multiple figures lined together. We also saw how to control line properties, such as the line width or the color. We also saw how to handle multiple figures and axes. Moving forward, we talked about handling text. So in case you want to describe your figure in a more fancy way, you could do so using matplotlib's plot.text. Moving forward, we talked about grids, how to limit your plot, whether it's on the x-axis, y-axis. And if you want to be more specific, you could annotate text with arrows. Like, let's say you want to show where your local max and min are. You could do so using matplotlib's annotate function. You can also plot using different scales, whether logarithmic, symmetric, logarithmic, or logistic. We talked about something really important, that is the imread and imshow how to read a figure, manipulate this figure, and show this figure. Also gave a small demo about what you can do with M read and M show, such as generating your own barcodes. We also talked about alpha blending and layer images, right? Filling curves, rendering math equations using LaTeX, and last but not least, we talked about polar plots. So thanks for watching. If you found this lecture beneficial, please leave a like on the video, subscribe to my channel. If you have any questions whatsoever, kindly leave a comment down in the comment section below and I'll make sure I'll get to it as soon as possible. Also consider donating to my Patreon account any amount you wish. Thanks for watching and I'll see you in future lectures.